you can download it. And for those that, I guess you did a Jupyter notebook tutorial, they can also download it locally. Um, yeah, so I'll put that up also up on the, um, the website too. Okay. Okay, I think we got most folks here if you want to get started uh, and maybe give the instructions again. Uh, we are now recording. And introduce yourself, but with your mute, mute button off. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Christian Aganze. I am a graduate, graduate student here at UC San Diego. I'm currently working with Adam Bergasse. Um, my research focuses on uh, trying to do galactic archaeology using brown dwarfs. That just means we're trying to study to understand the evolution and the formation of a galaxy through the lens of its smallest uh, mass object. Um, today, my talk is going to be, um, rather than I talk, it's going to be a tutorial on how to make plots with, my, with uh, this um, in Python. And um, I don't know, you haven't done any plots today. So this is probably gonna be a, uh, your introduction today, at least for plots. How many people have actually used matplotlib before in here? Just a, you can do a thumbs up, a reaction. How many people? One person, two people. Okay, so this is gonna be, this is gonna be good for and a beginner and a, and a person that has used Matplotlib before, they can also learn something from it. So the instructions are here. So if you just copy this, not copy this link, but if you just type this short link into your browser, it will take you to a page that looks like this. And then if you up, you click on this red button here, sorry, blue button, you will open a notebook that looks like this. And then you can copy it and start working with it. So I'm gonna give folks a couple of seconds. There's something in the chat. So Adriana, you said not me, not me what? Sorry. Did are you are you okay? Do you have? Can you access the? Uh, uh, yes. Okay, great. Okay. Yes, are you okay? Sorry, I am I'm busy with this new link. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. Yeah. No problem. So can everyone give me a thumbs up if they have access the link? Usually people, um, or maybe, okay, I see thumbs up from everyone, almost everyone. If you're still struggling with the link, uh, that's fine. You can just follow through what I'm doing. Um, so the module, the modules, so Python is good because it has a lot of modules or built-in libraries, in other words. And um, one of those libraries that we're going to be using today is called matplotlib. And the other one is called Seaborn. From Seaborn, we're gonna getting, be getting some uh, data. And from matplotlib, we're gonna be using all our plotting uh, functions, except later for Seaborn, we'll also do some plotting in there, some advanced plotting. There are many other uh, plotting fun uh, libraries in Python. You can check them out yourselves just by Googling this word. So I'm just mentioning if you hear RVs, Altair, Bokeh, and they all have their uh, pros and cons, but I would stick to my plot lead because it's been, at least it's the most popular one. And uh, that's the one I use. If you, I guess this doesn't apply. If you're working locally, on your net, on your machine, and you don't have Seaborn installed because it doesn't come in the default Python Anaconda installation. You can just use this command. But since I think the majority of people are working from um, you working from the collab, is that correct? You can give me a thumbs up. Is anyone lo working locally on their on their machine? You can you can do thumbs like, up. Oh, there's one folks, person. Folks okay. Are, yeah. Yeah, so for those that are working that copy this to your machine, if you, you probably will need this library. If you just go to your terminal and do type this command here, you should be able to install your, to install Seaborn. So Bridget, that's, uh, that's the, 
if we're working on CoLab, that's the Google site. Yeah, maybe you can show on your screen, Christian, what the CoLab looks like because we it's the same one we were using. Yes, right. I see Ivar, good. <laughs> can you see this if I move tabs? Are you seeing the same? Yep. Okay, yeah, CoLab. so this is what it looks like. Um, so I'm, I'm just not okay. going to be coding good. here. Yeah. yeah, I just got it. All right, so here's some of the outlines. So I will, I will uh, just give a few of the plots that I use the most. So there's line plots, uh, scatter plots. And then I talk a little bit about histograms, which become important for showing distributions of data. And then using colors to, to tell, basically what we're trying to do is tell a story from plots. And then I'll talk a little bit about other advanced plotting uh, routines. So starting with, uh, hope the font is not too small. So this is how we, we import this library. So if you run these commands, import numpy, import matplotlib. So this is when you do import, it's calling all this um, uh, module called numpy and we're renaming it as NP just to shorten it. And we're also importing matplotlib, just the pyplot part of matplotlib because there's a, you can also import the entire matplotlib library if you want. And then we just shorten it as plot, PLT. And we're also importing Seaborn. Um, and then this command here only works for on Jupyter Notebooks or in IPython. And uh, it's just making sure our plot show um, on our plot show in the in the in the notebook itself. So this command here, matplotlib inline. You can also do matplotlib notebook, which will give you an interactive plot. If you want to try that one, you can also do it. Okay, so you can run this, or um, it will just it won't give you anything. So the data that we're going to be working on today is going to be some data collected called the Iris data set. So this is a, uh, one of the standard data sets that uh, people only, I guess, in data science like to use for many things. And this comes from um, measuring, uh, basically it's from biology. So we have this, this plant called, uh, species called Iris, I think. And they, you know, plants have these things called petals and sepals. So here I'm showing the measurements in this. So the measurements here of the petal sorry, would be. Sorry, Christian, uh, Juan uh, didn't see which three they had to import. Oh, sorry, okay. let's, thank, let's thank go you, back. Carlos. Thank, thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Carlos. Helped. Okay, thank you, Carlos. Yeah, so um, you can also, again, if you get the link, the entire notebook is already there. So I'm not yeah. adding anything new. Yeah, so Juan, if you can download that, uh, you know, go to the link that was sent around. Do you mean to send it again? I'll send it one more time, just in case. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, it's gonna be the same exact. Uh, okay, one got it, okay. Okay. So the data set that we're going to be using is from measuring the length and the width of these two uh, parts of a plant um, for different, for three species. And it, we're gonna try to visualize it. Uh, I chose this data set because it's very easy to visualize and it's not a large data set. But in, uh, in your research, respective research projects, you're probably gonna be using data from astronomical observations. Sorry. Um, so this is how we get a data set from Seaborn. So we just call this function from Seaborn called load data set and it has this uh, Irish data set. And we're putting this into this thing called data. Uh, and data here is going to be a pandas data frame, which is what Adam is going to talk to. It's going to talk about it next. So this pandas data frame is just another uh, object in Python that stores uh, data, just like Roman talked today about list. Pandas data frame are tables. Um, so we're just going to, if you do this, the cell here, it's going to load the iris that I set into this thing called data. And then this is what, let's 
oh, there's a, um, a spelling error here. I meant to say preview. So let's, if you want to preview, again, this is something Adam is going to talk about later when he talks about pandas that are frame. But if you just do data.head, it will, it will preview the, five, the top five columns. So columns zero, column one to column four. And just to see what's in this. So in this data set, we have the length of the sepal, uh, the width of the sepal, and the same thing for the petal, and the what species. So in this case, the five columns are for this species called setosa. I'm not sure what this species look like in real life, but um, in the units here, let's just consider them to be arbitrary. Let's just consider them to be, let's say, centimeters. This is not going to be important for what we're visualizing here. Is everyone, is this good? Everyone's following? I haven't lost anyone. So we're just visualizing the five. Uh, we haven't made any plots yet. We're just visualizing the five columns of the data. It's always a good practice to just look at the data before you plot it. And then let's start with the first common plot, which is just a line plot. And what the, so I'm gonna walk through the syntax. Uh, so what this looks like is we call this thing, again, remember plot is from our uh, uh, matplotlib library. We, remain, we, re, we renamed it PLT. And when we do subplots, it gives us these two objects here, which is a figure and its axis. And usually we don't plot on the figures, all the plots are made by uh, on the axis. So here we're gonna do ax.plot. And then, um, by the way, in, the, in this notebook, I also have a link to the documentation um, so that you can see all the options that this each function provides. So ask that plot, we just uh, take in the, the X. So here we, we're plotting the, on the X axis, we're plotting the sepal length. On the Y axis, we're plotting the uh, pedal width. And that's, that's all it does. Um, and then we can, once we do that, we can also set the properties of this axis. So we can name the, the X axis, put, put numerical labels on it. And uh, in, in, in also, I'm assuming Norma talked about this, everything that has a hashtag in front of it is a comment. So this line will be ignored. Only uh, lines that are uh, in black here will be run. So what this output is this uh, figure here in the notebook. And um, we can see that there's maybe a one-to-one -one correlation between the sepal length and the petal width. Can everyone uh, run this part of the notebook and see if we, anyone is struggling or if you have any questions about the syntax? Let's see in the chat. Okay, so this is straightforward. However, this plot is, does not, doesn't look very intriguing. So there's... Christian. Yes. Uh, the sentence fig, what is your function? Sorry, would you mind repeating that? Uh, in the four, fig? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what, is, what is your function? Why? I think the confusion, Christian, is that there's two variables mm -hmm. equals something, which is kind of unusual notation. Can you explain yeah. that a little bit? Yeah. So, All right. Yeah, this is an unusual notation. Usually, um, so what this plot that subplots return is a, um, a tuple, which is just a, uh, it returns two variables together. It's just like a list of two variables. In the first variable, we, call, we are calling it uh, feed. Sorry, my slide is. We're calling the first one fig and the second one we're calling axis. So it's two variables and we're naming them on this line. You can also call the entire thing one thing. But, uh, so one way to check what they are, you can just uh, open a new cell and just do plot subplots and see what happens. All right. Uh, uh, it's two objects, fig is one. 
AX is two. AX is uh, a set of points. Uh -huh. If it is a picture, uh -huh. see? What, yeah, what I think, the way I think of X, I think of it as the, the axis. So when you get to subplots, you probably understand how this X object works because we, we can have multiple of them in one figure. So I think of it as this, this, uh, this layout here. Uh, does that make sense? Okay. Maybe when we get to subplots, you understand better why this X is different from fig. Um, so okay. all the Thank plots you. are, yeah, all the plots are done on this X object here, not the fig. That's just how, uh, and then uh, just something to keep in mind is this is one way of using map.lib. Um, the link to the, there's so many ways of, Every single thing here in Matlab can be changed mostly. That's how they design this language. So it's um, so just to keep that in mind, you're going to find a lot of syntax, but this is what I, uh, I like to use just uh, for personal uh, preference. So the next thing is the step plot, which looks the same syntax. Instead of doing axe that plot, here we're going to do axe that step. And this is. Uh, kind of like a line plot, but we said we're going in steps. Um, still doesn't look super intriguing. And I'm still, I'm still labeling everything here. Um, so I remove those comments, but I'm still labeling the X and the Y axis. Um, and you can say we, we're telling the story that, you know, the pedal's width increases with the step all length. The, 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 I think the plot, the, the type of plot that's more appropriate, sorry, I went two things above, the, that's more appropriate for this kind of data is called a scatter plot, which you will find a lot in, um, I'm sure you've seen this kind of plots before, where uh, we just, each point is actually represented as a point on the, on, on, the, on the figure. So each one of these will be, each measurement is a point, they're not linked together and they're separate. So this is a much better looking graph, um, in my opinion. And the syntax is still the same. Uh, so we're calling x that scatter, and we're passing the x value, x axis and the y axis. By the way, this notation data dot separate length is something that probably Adam is gonna talk about. It's just a, a property of this pandas data frame. There's any questions so far? You can also run this on your on your notebook. So again, some syntax, we just, instead of using that plot, we're using that scatter. And then, so sometimes, or most of the times in our data, we actually have uncertainties in our data, uh, meaning there's some error bars on it. Uh, in this data set, there's no error bar, so I'm going to create my own. So I'm going to choose 10% of each point just for, uh, to make it uh, the error bar. And here I'm just going to go do a little bit of panda syntax and to integrate something Roman talked a little bit today about for loops. So this for loop here goes, so the syntax is for this variable named column. In each one of these columns, I'm gonna create a new column called it error column. It's just the name of that column. So you take the column and you add air, underscore error in front of it. And then I'm gonna uh, add that 10% um, of each data, I'm gonna make that the, the error. Um, and then looping through, so for the first iteration, we, the column here will be sepa length column error will be sepulent error and then data uh, will be you just take that sepulent and multiply it by 0.1. Um, you see probably more of this that uh, uh, panda syntax later on but what I'm showing is just I'm creating a new column to the data and then I'm displaying that data again and I've added this these columns here. Uh, if you so to, the way we plot error bars in Matplotlib, we use this um, function called error bar, which uh, now will ask you to provide 
um, X error and Y error. Notice the uh, different um, syntax here. So we pass the X, Y, and then X error is passed as an optional argument. So we can still, uh, you can run this cell with that X error and Y error, and it will still run. And then the format here is saying uh, this, the, uh, the shape of this is gonna be a circle. So we can use uh, markers that are triangles, marker, any, we can use rectangles. And in this, uh, in this notebook, I also have, uh, uh, at each, after each, each, each one of these, I have like an exercise there where you can uh, kind of change something about the, the something about the, um, the plot that I just made. So the key takeaway is here is that you have you introducing the new syntax of optional arguments x call x error and y error, and then we just display those errors nicely. So I'm gonna let everyone run up to this. See if they have any questions. Okay, since there are no questions, I'm gonna go to the next kind of plot, which is uh, distribution plots. So we're gonna start plotting histograms. So to plot, uh, histograms are a good way to represent uh, a distribution. So for example, here we're gonna plot a one, dis one dimensional distribution of the sepal length. Uh, feel free to change, to change this to another column. Um, so the syntax is that um, we're calling axe.hist, which uh, just does a one dimensional histogram. So on each, each one of these will be the number. So it returns this thing, uh, bins, so all the bins and the edges of the bins. So each bin here, so for instance, this bin start, well, you can print it and see, this one is centered around 4.5, this bin is probably centered around 4.7 and so forth. And the exercise that I have here is to change the number of bins and see if the histogram looks better. So, and also you can print these bin edges here and see what those numbers are actually. Um, and this is a, this just gives us uh, the number of plots. You can see that most of the uh, sepalent is centered around six. In this case, we said these things are gonna be centimeters. So let's say six centimeters. And then we can, oh, I printed it, printed it. So if you print those bin edges, so this, this thing here, that comes out of X histogram, it tells you that um, the number of points. So we have nine, uh, 23 objects, 14 objects, 27 objects. So we have nine objects between uh, 4.3 and 4.66 and so forth. Um, and then we can also do two D histograms instead of just showing one, one, one dimension. Uh, in this case, we're plotting uh, the length of the sepal. We can plot two dimensions. So those are called two D histograms. So in this case, we have the same syntax. Um, Except here, I'm going to introduce a color bar to, to show uh, what this color stands for. So, um, again, we assign this ax that his, his, to, his 2D to something. And then uh, we're going to create this thing called a, a color bar. So, this is now we, we are using uh, the figure object because the, um, the color bar is really a property of the, the figure, not just this axis. Um, and the way the color bar uh, works is you, you give it the, uh, the data. So in this case, the data comes from the, the histogram. Um, and then you give it the ax that you want to plot it on. So this is gonna be sorry, on this axis. 
And then there's some optional, this, and the rest are optional. The axis is also an optional, um, an optional um, argument. And then you can make it a vertical or horizontal. And so there's so many options. Um, and I link that to the documentation for you to discover. And, and the exercise that I have here is to, let me see, is it to change the number of bins? You cannot change the number of bins. Um, this looks much better. So we can still see the one correlation between sepal length and sepal width. Actually, sorry, petal width. This is a, this is a mislabel. Although petal and sepal kind of sound the same. Um, so this, this gives you a nice, so if you, had, if you have a two dimensional plot that you want to visualize, um, this could be a good way to show it. Um, so the most, this, this color here is showing that the number of, of, of object is mostly centered around here and you have some sparse uh, object here, but there's one linear correlation. Any questions about histograms and one the histogram? One, one thing to do is when, uh, when I want to plot something in my plot, lead, there's this thing called a matplot library, matplot um, um, So there's something in the chat. I think I need to do my own test to see how it works. Yeah, I think that's, um, that's the entire point of providing the notebooks is that you can run this and at the end of each, each cell I have an exercise. So you can try to do that. Yeah, and I'll just I'll just repeat that the reason you know these notebooks are here not that you follow the exact instructions, but you start changing little things in the cells and just seeing what happens. So you know we're going to go through as Roman did just really quickly through you know the pieces, but you should take some time you know especially this week to kind of see what happens if I add this thing here or change this number here and how that affects the plot because um, that will give you kind of a feel how these things work. Yeah. And I was hoping uh, maybe we have, uh, I don't run the entire hour and then you can uh, have some time to, to, uh, to, to change some things right now. So Dino, you... had, Dino had a question about what the H really looks like and what are the corresponding axes? Could you uh, explain Dino... what the H looks like? Yeah, Dino, um... can you unmute and explain what you mean by the H? Yeah, so you're reading like this uh, two-dimensional histogram as uh, his 2D, but uh, how it look, really looks like when you like putting, say, the data in X and Y and how it's being read in uh, the, say, H that you call in the, say, third line uh, on, on this cell. So Yeah. Could, yeah, thanks. So if we, if we print H, it's, uh, it has the, and, the, and the edges, but it also had the third object which is what I'm, I'm passing in the color bar here. Oh, this is not live. This one is. Da, da, da. Can you see, I changed the notebooks. Can you see this? Yeah. All right, so HU still has the same, uh, has now has uh, four. Um, and then, the good thing about, about um, using Jupyter Notebooks is you can directly look at the documentation. So let's do that. And, and while you're typing that, just to point out that, you know, that first big bunch of numbers there is the numeric representation of the figure that he, that he has above there, right? So those are the numbers that make the colors basically. Yeah. So it's this matrix, I guess this, although you have to be careful about how it's flipped. Um, yeah, it is flipped, you're right. <laughs> um, but I think, it, yeah. And then, so let's, let's look at what this each one. Uh, so if you do this, uh, any function in, 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 in the Jupyter notebook can do, if you put a question mark after it, you get um, the documentation. If people were documentation, so um, so this says that you pass in x, y, and there's some optional um, the number of beans, the range that you want to constrain, and each one of the input has 
further explanations um, in what kind of data type, whether they want an integer or uh, an array and so forth. And then you can also normalize it. If you want the histogram to be normalized, you can pass this density to be true or false. Uh, you can also weight your histogram. And then this is just to uh, put the color values on the, on the color map. So if you just want to uh, limit your color map in this region. And then what it returns, it returns the 2D arrays, which is the, which is this thing here that we're talking about, um, of how many points are in each one of those little grid points. And then it returns the edges of the x-axis, the edges of the y-axis, and this image here. And this image is what I, I, uh, I put in the color bar. If you want, so this image is another object. Uh, I don't know if we talk a little bit about objects in this, in the next, uh, some, sometime. Yeah, but it's another, um, it's an, just another matplotlib uh, thing. And then you pass it into the color bar and then you can, you have a nice color bar. So this is why I did um, H minus one. And minus one just means the last one, or you can also do it. Uh, I guess H0, H1, H2. Does that make sense to people? Maybe should I continue just here because uh, better than the presentation mode? Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think it'd be easier to see it this way. Yeah. So now let's talk about using color. So the exercise that I had here was just if you adjust the number of beans. Um, what happens? Yeah. So the problem with histogram is they depend on the number of bins. Um, so you have to choose those carefully to tell the story that you want to tell. Um, and then since, since we're starting to introduce colors, I might as well talk about it. So how do we use colors effectively to uh, display some of our data? So here in this, uh, uh, what I'm just doing in this cell is I'm just seeing how many unique species are in there. Because uh, remember data has four columns, sorry, five columns. Is it four? Let's just, let's just check. I also added more. So data has this column called species and I wanted to see how many of them do we have. So I'm just using this numpy.unique, which is uh, from a different library in NumPy, but it shows you how many unique things you have in the, in the list. So we have three unique arrays and I'm gonna break them. So I'm gonna break the, that, the data frame into three arrays to plot them. This is like the painful way of doing it, but let's just go with it. So I'm gonna create a new data set called Setosa data. So that's for the Setosa species. The syntax here is that I just do data species equals Setosa double equal sign. So this returns a bunch of Boolean variables, true or false. And that will uh, create a small data set called the Setosa data. And, and for, I'll do that for the other two species. And then to, to show, to change the colors, so the syntax, you just do color equal. So we, we're still using the same thing, the same, the same syntax. So figure axis equal plus subplots. We're carrying this figure in X um, objects and we plotting each data frame separately and we labeling it. Um, and then after you do the labels, you, you call a legend. So, and then if you, we've asked that legend or plot that legend also work if you have one axis. And that will put the legend here, but you can also change the legend to something else upper left let's say upper right that will put to the right or lower left or lower right and if you're not sure what plot that legend does you can again go to the documentation and do um plot that legend and they will tell you exactly what it does okay so the point of this plot was not to talk about legend, but to show that you can start telling colors. So you can start uh, using colors. Um, 
that in this sense, uh, the blue, this blue, the cetosa species are here the, in this uh, sepal length petal wave space that I created. And then the virginica spaces, uh, species are the, here, the, the red ones, and then the versicolor on the middle. And this is probably gonna be a hint to the people that are doing a project in machine learning is that this is three different classes of objects or three different species of flowers that naturally separates out if you plot them in, in this two dimensional space. So that's the story. So that's the story from this plot. And then the exercise here is to see if you can, um, um, you can plot the histograms as well for these two different species. And then you can also use the numbers, uh, the numbers. So if you wanna plot a third dimension, so in this case, we're only plotting two dimensions. If you wanna plot a, a, a third dimension, you think, oh, I wanna do a 3D plot. Um, we, we rec I, I usually recommend against 3D plots. I don't like them. I did, um, unless you, you're plotting a uh, specially three dimensional object. But in this case, we're just plotting uh, properties of flowers, they don't need to be in three dimensions. So another way of representing uh, a dimension is using colors. Uh, you can also change the size of this. But let, so if we just change the, which say the color here is gonna be C, not color. If you do color, it's gonna crash because they just hard, it was hard coded. But if you do C, that will give it the numerical colors. So, and then we're still adding a nice color bar here at the end. Notice that this doesn't return three objects. So you just pass whatever acts as scatter returned and you just pass that into the color bar. And you can see that now we're plotting three things. So the sepal length, petal width, and uh, sepal width. Here, I'm not quite sure what the story is. Just look like it's, uh, the color doesn't really add anything. You can also change the color map. So what sets of colors do we choose from? So in this case, I'm choosing a different color map called Cool Warm. And if you wanna check out all the colors here, color maps here, uh, you can click on this link here and they will give you a set of color maps. The default color map that people usually use, it's called Viridis. And if you've seen those gravitational wave papers that they publish early with the LIGO team, they used to use this color map called Verdis, because it shows really well in, uh, shows really the difference between, uh, uh, between uh, on the image, and also shows it when the image in, is in grayscale. So if you, if you were to print this in black and white, uh, it's the, color, the Verdis color map still works really well. Um, any questions? We have like a few more things to go through, but I think this is, uh, if you can do scatter plots and show colors and show error bars in your plots, uh, I think you, you can show most of the astronomy stuff that we do. And then let's talk a little bit about subplots. Um, to be honest with you, I don't quite understand exactly um, all this, the intricacies of matplotlib, like where the subplots come from, how do they use them, but this is how I use them. I usually think of them as rows and columns. So you remember here we're using plus subplots and we're not putting anything in this parenthesis. So now we're gonna change that and we're gonna start putting things in this parenthesis. N calls here is the number of columns. So we're gonna do two columns and then you can also, Later, we can also change the number of rows, but let's just do columns right now. And you can also change the figure size. And if you wanna know everything you can put in this plot subplots, again, you can do plot subplots and that will give you every, all the options and what it returns. But for now, let's just stick with the syntax. So ax now is now a list of two ax objects. Maybe I should have named it axes, but ax has the, um, sorry, wrong ax. Ax is the list of, um, 
one subplot and then the other subplot. So on the first, on the first, uh, on the first column, we're going to plot just the sepal length and the petal width, and then on the second, we're going to plot uh, petal and sepal width. Um, and then we can also change, you can change a bunch of things. You can, let's, if you were to do this as rows and rows, oh, the W key is broken on my computer, so I can do in rows right now. <laughs> uh, I have to copy W from something else to, to put it there. But yeah, you can also change this. Carlos another. has provided a W for you. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Yeah, the W key is broken on my computer. The only the only key that's broken, which is strange. All right, so in rows, so now this will put in, now the figure looks weird, but uh, you can also change this to 410 instead of 104. Mm. Yeah, so this plots in any in rows instead of columns. You, so feel free to play with this and see what kind of layout you can have. And the exercise is to do four by four and put every column by against each other. And then um, getting closer to the end, um, you can also add grids. So this is just styles. You can add uh, ticks and grids to the uh, to the properties of your map. If, if you want to see an actual, um, this is good if you want to customize your grids, your, sorry, your, your plots. So to add a grid, you just do ax that grid. If you're using one, one axis, if you're using, so if you're using uh, just for that one axis, you can do plot that grid. And then uh, I usually, to do minor ticks, I usually just use this, this command here, ax that minor ticks on, but there's other ways you can do you can do this manually and just do ax that ticks. Um, so ax that ticks will also, but here you have to actually pass those ticks in. So what the ticks are are this these ticks here. So we have this minor ticks here between four point five and five point zero, and you have you have full freedom to customize all of this. So some people like grids, some people don't like grids. Um, so a styling issue. And then one thing I wanted to, at least people don't want to say is that you can actually visualize everything without using any colors, um, which is helpful because uh, sometimes now, not people, everyone has like uh, access to a printing machine, but colors are very misleading. So for instance, if you want to listen astronomy, like using red versus blue, uh, could be misleading to the story that you want to tell from your plot. So it's always a good practice to use just grayscale and then add colors later. So in this, in this exercise here, I'm plotting now uh, the histogram and, this, and the scatter plot uh, on one, in one figure. This is, the, this is just copied from, from before. So I'm now using two columns. I'm changing the figure size a little bit to fit the, this layout that I'm using. And uh, I'm, so what, what's changing is I'm calling, uh, I'm giving each, uh, each uh, so let's start with the first one. So the first one is plotting the sepal length versus petal weight for the cetosa species. And we're labeling it as cetosa and we, we're plotting it as, as circles. And we, the fill in color, so this color tells you the, uh, the color that you're gonna fill in in the marker. So we're not filling in anything. That's why it's empty. It's just white. And you can also do the colors of the edges can be black. You can also make it blue. Oh, sorry, not blur, blue. So that changes it. So feel free to play with everything. But the point I wanted to, uh, to take from here is that you can actually visualize these data sets without using any colors. And be able to tell the difference that this, uh, the cetosa species are here at the bottom, which is this histogram here. And then the, uh, the versicolor species is, is the middle. And then the uh, virginica species is at the top. And you can do that without having to use colors. Uh, just playing with this, 
the colors of the edges. And for the histograms, you can play with uh, what we call the, the width of the lines. Uh, you can play with the line style. So this is the dotted line style. You can also use like a point dotted line style. Oops, that doesn't work. Maybe it's pointed dot. Okay, right, so that's a different kind of line style. And so feel free to play with this and see what kind of layouts you can get. So since we're getting closer to the end, um, there's some default styling issue, styling in Matplotlib, and this is how you call them. So if I want, just want a grayscale style, so this is just gonna take care of all the ticks and all the colors and so forth. Um, and this, probably some design person thought about it more carefully. And there's this style called the gray, uh, grayscale. So the way you call it is you use this, co this command called width. This will just make sure it's only displayed in this cell. It doesn't bleed over to the other cells. And then don't worry about the, the plots because I'm just copying everything I did here. And this just will plot everything in grayscale. And then there's another uh, one that I like to use called uh, 538. And this 538, I think is the same style they used to display like election results. Um, you have a really nice grid and there's no, uh, this, you, it's all, again, it's all a matter of preference, but you wanna make sure that the styles uh, doesn't take away from the point that people wanna get from your plots. But there's a style called 538 and this is how you call it. You just use with plot that style context, uh, uh, 538. And that just gives you this really nice uh, layout. Um, so I didn't have to think about the, you know, all of this. Of course, you can change all of this manually in the, uh, in the map load documentation. Um, this is just styling, styling thing. And then here, the only thing we've shown is scatter plots and uh, histograms. But there's some advanced visualizations here. So what I like to do is there's some, uh, if you go to these links here that I posted, you can just go to the gallery. So if I click to the Seaborn gallery, so we're moving to the next, we're moving from Matplotlib now we're using Seaborn. So if you just click on this first link, you, it will take you to a bunch of examples of interesting plots that can be overwhelming. And you can say, I wanna plot this plot here. And just click on it and we show you how to create a plot like this. So one thing that I try to plot is called a block box plots. And these box plots are gonna be from a data set called uh, a planet data set. And this is just a, from the exoplanet catalog at NASA and there's a source there. And this, uh, we, 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 you can pass, you can pass um, the axis here. So let's just go, line by line. So here I'm using the theme called ticks. Um, again, another styling thing. There's so many themes in Seaborn, so you can notice that I changed the syntax. I'm no longer using with. I don't think Seaborn's, just the way it's, it's uh, coded doesn't allow me to do that. And then I'm still doing my figure axis uh, to create the axe and I can, uh, I can manipulate that axe. So here I'm just putting the axe on a log scale um, you can also do, instead of doing ax that set, x scale is low, you can do ax that set and then x scale equals log. And that will just put x on a log scale as well. So both work. And then the data is from the planets that I set from Seaborn. And what the box plot is, let's just get to the plot. So what it does is uh, it's plotting the distribution. So here we have the, so what, let me just talk about the data. So the data is just a uh, collected uh, measurements of exoplanets that have been discovered so far. I'm not sure if it's up to date and it has discovery method here, which you're playing on, on the right. And then distance, I think this is in light years. And what's the, um, the center here is going to be this box plot here, just what, um, uh, where the data lies. So this would be the median, and this would be the, and, and on, on, the, on this side, we have the third quartile, which is, which is you, you can also change here. Uh, and quartiles are just like, what's the 75% uh, of the data. 
and then this will give you uh, 25 percent so this is what uh, this line is here is doing so it's plotting distance on the x-axis and the method of discovery of the planet and we're passing that data it has to be passed as a, a pandas data frame which is what adam is going to talk about and this here is just showing uh the syntax is just showing like which points should we take as outliers so if i was to put it's saying consider points below zero and 100 percent of the data to be outliers which you know every point is between zero and 100 percent but you you can imagine that you want to show outliers between like 10 percent and 90 percent and i think this is the line width and then you can also change the the color so color everything separately but you can also make this since color is misleading you can make everything just the same color oh i guess it has a default color set it, it, it has to just uh, make everything some color but um and then on the top of that we, we, we're adding this strip plot which is just uh again plotting each each one of these data individually uh and then this is just a, uh, the last, um, we're just using grid again, another way of using grid, we can just use also X that uh, grid. This one was just doing grid on X axis alone, but you can also do a grid on the Y axis. I think that this will work. That Y axis grid is true. Okay, this also works to put the grid on the y axis. The point is not to go over so much of the Seaborn library, just to show you that you can make really sophisticated plots um, and tell a story. So, the story here will be that uh, most of the planets are uh, discovered by these three methods here radio velocity, imaging, and transit. And the, uh, re relative, the most uh, distant planets are probably found using microlensing. And you can just tell this story from just displaying the data. And then the, I think maybe we're running out of time. Um, you can also do things called heat maps, but let me just skip this and stop here uh, to take any questions, because this is just a lot of information that I throw at you. So feel free to play with this uh, notebook and look, consult all the links that I, that I added in here and play with the exercise and see if you can uh, learn something. At least you should be able to do a scatter plot and the histogram, and one the histogram. Uh, and that would be very useful in your research program. Yeah, and I'll just reemphasize that, you know, we're providing these not to be complete in all of the ways that you can manipulate and visualize the data, but so you have some examples to build off of. and. Um, you should be taking some time after this to go back through and play through and try changing different variables. And if something looks really neat, you want to learn more, you know, there's, I mean, the best thing is that all this is so commonly used in programming that it's very easy to Google questions about how do I do this thing? How do I do that thing? It's very, uh, there's a lot of help online for that. So yeah, any questions for Christian? We might be getting to the end of the day burnout a little bit. <laughs> yeah, same. Um, yeah. It has been very useful. I didn't know to disagree. Yeah. Yeah. And Dino has just said that uh, you know, he's not yet seen a Python issue. He can't Google. I have found Python issues I can't Google, but I tend to break things in much worse ways. Uh, I, I need my my own test, uh, like with, uh, with the calls. So, uh, but uh, in, for uh, in, uh, to see uh, how it works, this uh, uh, practice, practice. Exactly this. right. Yeah. And the great thing is because we use uh, tools like Matplotlib all the time to, to visualize our spectra, to visualize the measurements we make, you will definitely get lots of practice. So yeah, this will get, definitely get more familiar when we don't just have an hour to, to go over it. 
Yeah, I spend most of, not most of the time, a lot of time trying to visualize things. And it's, the more you do it, the better. And some jobs are actually just visualizing data. Yeah, and Christian does this much, actually both Christian and Dino do this much better than I do because they've been spending a lot more time on it. So um, they're definitely available to, to give uh, advice, particularly if you want to make those plots really uh, stand out. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, not really for the um, cause, because I, I need to practice too. But the question is about the, the tutorial, the Windows, Windows, where we have all this stuff. It's, um, it's going to be um, accessible for us anytime or just or you are going to give us give gave us kind of permit to use them. So I interest to make me clear. Uh, I th I think a little bit. So the yeah, so certainly you know if if you have either Jupyter Notebook working on your computer yeah. or you've been able to use Google Colab, obviously those are available all the time. Um, mm -hmm. And then in terms of the um, so these tutorials we're going to post on. Um, uh, both the website and Roman has also set up a, um, a GitHub site where those materials are, so you can access those at any time. Um, and again, you know, you can just open that file up in Google Colab, or you can open that up in Jupyter Notebook. Um, perhaps we could do like, a, I, I could maybe do a, just a quick demonstration on how to do that. It's very straightforward. Um, yeah, so those, it's just those files, those IPYNB files that um, will make those available so you can use them, yeah. Yes, yes, I get, I understand. So okay. let's, I, let's practice then. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yes, yes. Carlos, uh, did you have another question? Uh, yes, uh, other set uh, for um, test, for practice. Uh, I'm sorry, say that again. Uh, um, other set for practice. Oh, you want to have other, uh, uh, like kind of example tutorials for practice? Uh -huh. Example, see. Um, I think, well, maybe we can find a few others. So we, you know, we're sharing the ones that we've either adapted or created, um, but I think we could probably find a few more examples. Honestly, what I usually do, for example, for the Matplotlib uh, stuff, and, and probably Christian does this for the Seaborn, is I'll go to the Matplotlib page and I'll just look at the, I'll actually just look at the plots that they have and then they provide the code. So I'll just copy the code and just put it into my Google you know, uh, notebook, my, my Jupyter notebook, and then just manipulate the variables until I find something that I like. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, any other questions before we take a, a short break? Okay. All right, so let's take a five minute break here. We'll come back at 5.05 uh, and we'll have our last workshop of the day. And then you get a day off. <laughs> so you can kind of rest a little bit and you can start playing with some of these, uh, these uh, well, worksheets and, and sort of get a little bit more familiarity. And again, it feels like a very you know, complex language. There's so many variables. It's kind of a weird notation in some cases that you know, I, when I started Python, it was very unfamiliar to me. Um, it will get uh, familiar as you as you do more, and um, we will definitely have a lot of opportunity to practice. Okay, so let's take a, a five minute break, and again, we'll come back at five oh five and uh, finish up for today with pandas. Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, we're going to now jump into yet another package uh, and there's a lot of them out there um, and we're only touching the, the surface, but this is an important one because this is going to be about a package called Pandas. Um, and Pandas is a, uh, a software uh, tool that uh, allows you to work with uh, spreadsheets of data. So basically if you've ever used anything like Excel or Google Sheets, um, this is a code that allows you to manipulate the data that's in those kind of sheets. And we're gonna find it's much more powerful than something like Excel or Google Sheets because you can do a lot more sophisticated operations. You can visualize the data. 
Um, in fact, a lot of the things that Christian was showing in terms of, of plotting uh, information uh, can be done pretty easily with pandas as well because it has its own built-in visualization tools. So uh, if you can take a moment to click on the link I just sent there, that should take you to, uh, I haven't actually tried this myself from the outside, but that should take you to the uh, same kind of Google Colab page. And I'll show you what I am seeing on my side. So you can see if that's the same. Let's see, here we go. Okay. Uh, yep, so here is the sheet that is, it looks on my page. Um, and this is going to be very similar to uh, what Christian did. I'm going to have a few little exercises interspersed in there and give folks, uh, you know, a few minutes to kind of play with that and then kind of do the big reveal. So, you know, if you are, are you know, want to challenge yourself and try to answer those exercises, that's great. Uh, the solutions are also already built in. So this is not a test where you're being, uh, you know, evaluated, um, but kind of a way to sort of uh, play around and, and test your knowledge as we go through. Um, and I may not get through all of the elements of this worksheet today, um, but I will leave it uh, for you to explore on your own uh, if we run out of time. Because uh, I do want to be mindful that, you know, you've been doing a lot of work workshops the last couple of days, so we want to keep it to a, a, a small scale. All right, so um, so this is what we're going to be we're looking at this Pandas uh, uh, package. Um, if you want to learn more, uh, the documentation on Panda is actually really fantastic. It's very clear. There's lots of tutorials on there as well. So if you want to learn more, you can go there. Um, for this, um, oops, let me actually expand all these so you can see them. So for this one, we're only going to use two different packages. The NumPy that you saw uh, previously in both uh, uh, Roman's talk and Christian's talk, and just Pandas. It's all we need for this, uh, for this workshop. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start looking at how we can read in data and start to get kind of just a quick review of the contents. Now, one of the great things about pandas is that it can read data from all kinds of sources. That includes just URLs, so just, just different websites. Uh, and so for one of the other projects that we've been doing to sort of build tutorials for our code, um, we have a few uh, uh, databases that we've posted up there. And that's what these links are down here at the bottom. And in fact, I think if I click on this link, I'm not sure what it will do. Let's actually bring it up. Um, this is just a um, what's called a CSV file. Let me show you what that looks like. Um, that looks like that. A lot of gobbledygook. Um, but this is just a whole bunch of data that's uh, comma uh, comma separated. So all the different uh, you know little cells are separated by commas, and then there's a whole bunch of lines that indicate that. And there's about 1,500 sources in here, so it's a pretty sizable data set. Um, and so what this uh, code is going to do is just read in these three files into a, a few structures um, that are the actual data frames. That's the language for pandas, uh, which really kind of the spreadsheet of data. And if you want to take a look at it, all we have to do is just type the name of that uh, variable in here. And it's going to bring up this table uh, of information. And it's shrunken down because 1500 lines would take up most of my screen. So they're just giving kind of the first four and la first five and last five lines in there. But you can scroll across and see uh, some of the, the values in here um, and all the columns at the top here. Um, you'll notice that there's a lot of these NANs that stands for not a number. Uh, and that's what happens when you have blanks in your spreadsheets. It replaces it with this NAN variable. And we'll see how we can use that to select things when we say missing data. Uh, we can either re replace that data or we can just ignore those uh, rows that don't have those, those data in there. Um, but this is just a nice way to kind of look through and see uh, what kind of data we have in this. And again, there's a lot of information here. Um, and the, the, this object is a pandas data frame. So if you do type on any of your variables, you can always find out what kind of thing, Python thing it is. And in this case, it's a data frame. Um, and we can do a few like quick looks at the data by just uh, a few functions here. One is just printing the head of the data. That's just the first five rows. Or we can look at the tail of the data, which is the last five rows. So that gives you sort of a shorter uh, snapshot of those. And I scrolled through to see all the column names, but you can also access the column names by just look at typing this dot columns. And that gives just a list of all those different column names. Um, and then finally, if we just want to see how big our data is, there's a few commands I've put here that's 
uh, primarily this uh, LEN, which is length in Python. Uh, length is able to interpret all kinds of different objects and figure out how long they are. Um, in this case, it will tell us how many rows and then the length of this column list. And then numpy.size is just telling me how many total elements. And so if I click that, you can see 1,500 rows, 22 columns, and those numbers multiplied together definitely give 33 thousand pieces of information. So this is a pretty, you know, this is not the biggest table we'll work with, but it's definitely a, a good sizable one. Um, so that's just the kind of little details. So what I'd like you to do, um, if you've gotten the, uh, the Python notebook up, and if you haven't, uh, please go ahead and use the chat window to, to ask questions, but take a moment to just play around with these. In fact, instead of using DF Spectra, uh, insert these other uh, uh, table variables, either DF sources or DF photometry. And just, you can just copy and paste and put those back in there and see what the different tables are giving you uh, in terms of information. So take a couple of moments just to, to do that on your own. And again, if you have any questions, you can put that in the chat window or just, just voice up. Adam, how how can we get to, into that those tables? So uh, you mean you mean access them? Yeah, I I am in the workshop of today, but should we click on, on look for those those tables? That was the instruction. That they, that was the instruction. So you don't have to look for them. They're already oh. linked right here. So if you run yes. this cell, they'll be loaded in. Oh. So that, that URL that starts with HTTP is pointing to a file that's online. And so that should, that should just read them in. So if you run that cell and there's no error message, then you got the data. Yeah, error. There is an error. Oh no. Okay. Sorry, did you run this uh, first cell up here where you import the packages? Yeah. Oh no. I, okay. I think that that's my but that's my error, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, this is so weak. <laughs> that's okay. This is the start. Yes. Well. I have a lot of numbers now. Okay, that's what we like. Lots and lots of data. Yeah. All right. So let's. Um. So good. So you're all set. Uh, you got that working, Adriana? Yes. Yes. I. I guess so. I. I am seeing a lot of numbers and letter letters. I think it's okay, right? Yes, that's exactly what we want to see. Lots of letters and numbers. Exactly. <laughs> Even I don't. I don't know what it doesn't mean. Well, we know it's some of them from our from our astronomy uh, uh, session yesterday, right? This designation, if you look on the screen, the designation here, that should look familiar. That's like a right ascension and declination. All so, right. So, so some of them will look familiar as we get more used to it. But I hope to get to know what does it mean later. Absolutely. Thanks. Okay, so let's go ahead into our next part where we're gonna actually start to access some of the elements in the table and, and everything's kind of closed up so you can, you can expand it by just clicking on the down arrow there. Um, and so, you know, you've got lots of information, but of course you don't want all of it all at once. You wanna select some certain things. Maybe you wanna, you wanna like shrink the table down and just get the parts of the table you want the most. So, um, so you know, just as a reminder, we can first figure out what are the columns we're, we're looking at. I'm gonna look at this DF Spectra uh, database first. And so here's the column names that come in there. And so I can use the column names to extract out just those columns of information if I use this bracket notation and single quotes. So I've taken this source key and just copied it down here between brackets 
and that gives me a list of all of the source keys, which are just five numbers. It's just a just kind of an, a, a reference integer. Um, you know, if I can, I can replace that with uh, let's say specs type, and what I'll get is a list of all the spectral types uh, that those sources correspond to. So that allows us to look at kind of one column at a time. Um, you can also use this dot notation. So it's the same variable source key, but now it's just DF spectra dot source key. And that's what Christian showed in his, uh, his presentation. That gives essentially the same thing as uh, when I put source key up in the previous one. Now you can also extract out a few columns. So in some cases, the tables might be really big. I mean, this one has 22 different columns. I may not necessarily want all of those columns. So you can kind of down select the columns you want by putting an array or a list of those column names within those two brackets. You kind of see two brackets on either side. And if I do that, what it returns is a sort of a mini version of the table above, but it just contains these three columns. That's it. So again, this is useful when you're, you know, let's say you, you've got some really big database of lots of information, but you don't actually want all of it. And you can just select down the individual columns that you care about. Now we can also select by row. So if I want to look at just one source in this, uh, this database, for example, um, then the notation here is this dot LOC, which means location, right? So let's say I want to look at the 10th row in my, um, in my, uh, my database there. This is what the 10th row looks like. And these are all the different column names and the values for that one source. So if I put in say a thousand, I get the thousandth object in the list. Right, this is just returning one object at a time. Um, if I want more than one object, let's say I want uh, 10 objects in between 10 and 20, uh, that's what this notation looks like. You can see that, that uh, number colon number notation that Roman showed earlier today. And that's gonna choose the, uh, I think, the, well, we'll see, <laughs> I click on this, it's the uh, 10th through 20th number of rows in the database. And um, you know, for example, if I want to choose the first ten, I can use that colon ten notation. That will give me rows zero through ten, so it's actually the first eleven rows. Or I can choose the last, um, let's say from fourteen hundred ninety on, will give me the last ten rows, and you can see that's where they are there. All right. So again, these are just different ways of kind of slicing and dicing the database and getting out the parts that you really care about. And then we can merge these selections. So let's say I want to take the 10 through 20 rows and only show these three columns. Then this command kind of combines those and just gives you a little mini table of just those 10 rows and just those three different columns. All right, so that's how you would kind of take out chunks of the table that you're interested in working with. And then at the very minimum, you can also just take one value out and you can do that either by using indices. So if I'm taking the 10th row in the 10th column over, that works out to be um, 120. I think that's probably the signal to noise. Um, either of these commands, by the way, work. Um, I at or I loc do basically the same thing. But you know, this is just like a you know like a, a, a graph, right? You're going to the you know 10th row down and 10 columns over, and that gives you that one value there. So that's one way to do that. And I, I should say, you could also do this in a different way. You could say, for example, um, if I want to select, um, and I'm going to define a new uh, data frame here, and I'm going to select um, just the one column. So I'm going to select the uh, median signal noise. And notice that it's helpfully providing sort of a, a hint of what the way to finish off this, this uh, the name is. So I can put that in there. And then what I can do is I can just select the 10th object in my new subtable, and this is actually 375 in this case. It must have been a different different object, right? So again, this is one way to kind of piece out uh, different ways of getting to the specific information within within the table. All right, so um, we can also do a selection by looking for particular values. So this is where we start to use our logical operators. And so here is this notation. Um, uh, this is what I want. Sorry, let's, oh, sorry, this has to go down. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm just going to move this into its order. 
Sorry about that. Okay, so let me do this one first. So, um, so let's say I want to take all of the rows uh, in my database for which the observation date is this particular string. And what this is our year, 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 month, month, day, day notation. You'll get really familiar with this with the specs reduction because this is the notation we use to organize our data. So this corresponds to 2003, the fifth month of May and the 22nd day. And so there's a column in our spectral database called observation date, which is this, these kind of integers. And so what I can do is I can say, give me the subset of the table where the observation date is equal to this value. So if I run that code, what you'll see is again, it gives me a subset of the table, but now notice that this column observation date is all the same value, right? So it's isolated just those objects or spectra that have been observed on this one particular date. And um, we can also, uh, if I move over here, one of the other things I might be interested in is knowing who actually observed the data. And there is a column here, observer, and I'm one of the observers here, but you'll notice there's a lot of blank lines. There's a lot of cases where we don't actually know who the observer is. So if I only want data for whom I know the observer, what I can do is a similar kind of notation here. But what I'm gonna do is now use this function not NA, right? So we're selecting the column observation time. Uh, oh, sorry. Actually, I'm using the observation time, so I'm, I should actually use observer. Let me do that again. Um, so I'm selecting observer not being NA to be true, right? And by the way, this double equal sign, this is how Python uses a logical equals. So there's a single equal sign where you assign a variable to a number. But the double equal sign says you're checking to see whether this is that. And I think Roman showed this a little bit earlier as well. So I do that selection. I'm going to get another table back. And now if I go over to the observer column, you'll see that all of the observer columns have a name next to them. So that was successful in just isolating the sector that have known observers attached to them. Now, um, I can also, if I'm interested in where in the table uh, these particular uh, that things are true, where these particular values are. Um, it's the same notation, except then I add on these extra little things here, dot index, dot values. This is calling two kind of functions here. Dot index is saying, figure out where this is true, and then tell me the indices, where in this table this is, and then provide the values for those indices. Because the index is actually kind of a complicated object, but this just gives me a number for what the values are. So if I click on this and I'm assigning it to a variable IND, so I'll print that out and you'll see you just get a, a, an array of integers. And this integers tells me where in my whole database that the data that was observed was observed on 2003, May 22nd. And um, I think this is gonna be the same case. Oh, so the other thing that happens um, and you can go and use this number to figure out, you know, like pull out those particular rows if you want. Now, one thing I'll point out is that when I did these selections, if I go back to this table up here, um, you'll notice, I scroll over, um, this first column of numbers is the index uh, of the rows. And they normally go from zero, one, two, all the way to the last row of your, of your data set. Um, but you'll notice that after I've done this selection, just the ones that have this particular observation date. Um, it actually starts at, thir it starts at 13 and then it stops at about 30. So in some level, the indices are now kind of out of order and that's usually fine. You don't really use the indices that much, but for example, if I wanted to pull out the first object in the row, uh, pandas can get confused if you say, give me the first thing and it uses the index, but there's no first, there's no zero element here. And so it will say, well, I can't find it because there's nothing that starts with an index zero. Um, you can fix that with a very simple command that is called just reset index. And you have to set these uh, additional uh, variables in place and true means you're always changing the table in place. Um, if you don't set this, it will temporarily show that, but it won't actually save that. Your table would preserve the way it was. So this actually changes the table. And then drop equals true means you're getting rid of the old index. So maybe just to show how that works, if I say drop equals false, so I'm making this selection, I'm resetting the index. So you can see that the first row now starts at zero like it should, 
but it's actually kept the other index numbers. And maybe that's useful um, if you want to keep that information. But often I will just drop that and you'll see that if I do that, then I just get the single row that's just the, the index numbers. Okay. I have a question. Yes, please. What what if you don't drop the index? Um you will have two indices. So when you type index, which one is selecting the zero or the 13, for example? Well, it still does the zero, but it's created basically a new column of information called okay. index. So, yeah. you know, that might be useful. You want to go back to the original table and figure out where the source is. Um, so it doesn't mess up the indexing, indexing, but it just gives you kind of this extra column. And you may or may not want that. Because like, what I mean, the index is zero, but there's a new column called index as well. So yeah, um, how, those are two different things. How do you things. call this? Okay. Yeah, so actually I should be careful. These are two different things. However, um, this notation up here, this dot index will probably get confused because- Yeah, that's, that, that's yeah. what I was uh, thinking about. So that's generally why I drop this extra index column mm -hmm. because then we just avoid that. Okay, Yeah. thank you. I haven't actually tried to see what happens if I leave it in, so I don't know. <laughs> um, okay. And then um, another thing we can do is, you know, so, so we have like a whole bunch of sources here. Maybe we don't want all of them. Maybe we just want one representative one or maybe one random example. Um, and so it has, uh, a pandas has this uh, up, uh, ability to just randomly select sources from a, from a, from a subset of things. Um, and so if I take, um, what I'm gonna do here is take the spectral database, get the first 11 rows and the data key column, all right, so I'm just taking that one little part of the table. And then I'm just gonna select one random thing from, from that. In fact, let's, instead of doing data key, let's do designation because it's a little bit more meaningful. So I'm taking the first 11 objects and I'm just gonna randomly pick out one designation. Uh, oop, didn't like that, hold on a second. They may have the wrong keys there. Let's do one data file. So the, the error there is because designation is not one of the columns in that table. So there's, uh, oops. Here, there we go. Okay, so it just chose the this one file name, number eight, with these kind of numbers. I could do this again, and it will pick a, another file name. I could do this again, and it'll pick a, another file name. So it's just randomly choosing out of these ten rows, and I can make it ten, or I can make it a hundred, I can make it a thousand. Um, it's just randomly selecting one out of those by just kind of random draw through them. And if I want more than one, I can just change the uh, quantities in here to n equals 10. So I'm gonna get 10 of the sources. Um, and in fact, there's a, a way you can also set it so it will replace those sources back in. So you're randomly drawing with replacement. So you can see that I choose zero twice and I choose nine three times, but I don't choose three at all, all right? So that would be with replacement. If I do it without replacement, then it's not so random because I have 10 objects and I'm taking, taking 10, I'm gonna pick all of them at some point. So you can do this randomization in different ways. And I should say, this is something that's useful if, again, if you just wanna get kind of a representative idea of what one of your objects in your sample looks like, randomly choosing one is a good way to do it. Um, and we actually have this built into the, our spectral code. Uh, there's a keyword where you can say lucky equals true and you just get one spectra of anything you want. It's a good way of sort of getting a, a random sample. All right, now the, the next step here, if we wanna do a more complex way of accessing subset of our data is we can actually set up a query string. And this is just a logical statement. Um, you may see this in some other um, Python codes where we're looking at how to uh, determine like an if then statement, for example, if this is true, then do this. Uh, so this is the same kind of notation. It's in uh, a string here. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select from the same database all of the spectra in which the observation date is after 2010. So this is 2010, January 01. So this is one of the great ways of using numbers for dates because it's easy to say if it's before or after a certain date. And I want all the spectra where the median signal noise is more than 100, so really high quality signal. So if I want both of those conditions, I can actually merge them together into this one statement with this query command. And again, what I'll get back is a subset of my table where those two conditions are true. So if I look at my table here, you can see that 
all of these dates are indeed after 2010, 2010 I should say. And um, if I scroll over to the signal to noise, which is way over here at the other end, right there, median signal to noise, you can see that they're all over 100, right? So again, this is a nice way to you know, get subsets of your spectra using these different criteria so that you can you know, just work on the data that you're really interested in. Any questions on, on uh, these selection uh, ideas? OK. Can I do multiple? And for that one, can you, Bridget, you want to unmute and, and clarify your question? It, yeah, because because you know how we use like observation dates and then we have like and when medium SNR is greater than 100. So can mm -hmm. we do that? And then and when like, I don't know, we make like another another. Like, yes. So let's totally. So let's do um, whoops. Sorry, got a little bit far here. Um, let's do um those two things and then i'm going to select the ones that have just looking for a good index to use here um let's use this specs type which is the spectral uh, spectral classification so we'll choose only the ones that have a spectral type of uh, l 1.0 now i think this might fail because I have used single quotes here, but you can kind of get around it by alternating between single quotes and double quotes. So the outside here is single quotes, but I wanna see if something looks like a string. So I just have to change my notation for what strings are. You can go back and forth between single and double quotes. Like I think if, you know, if, you, if you're paying attention, Roman always used double quotes and I always use single quotes. And I'm not sure if that's just like a preference or a taste, but that's just how I got used to using it. Um, but you can always, use the others if you want to put a string inside a, a notation like this. So if I do this, um, you'll get a much smaller table now. And you'll see that, again, everything's past 2010. Uh, all the spectral types are L1 and median signal noise are over 100. So yeah, you can add more there. Um, another thing you can do is you can say, um, instead of having an and, I can combine this in more complicated logic. So let's do both of these criteria and do and not specs type uh, equals L1. So that, oops, not or, I guess we gotta respell that, and not. Um, and now it will give me my original list, but if I go over to the spectral type column, uh, you'll notice that none of these say L1. So there's a lot of you know, more complicated logical strings you can put together, you can use or, um, you can use, you know, is something in something? There's a whole bunch of different logical uh, notations. And again, I would encourage you if, you, if you're not familiar with those for Python, uh, there's lots of documentation for that online. Uh, but you can build this kind of logical statement and then get down to the subset of the data you're most interested in. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, this include data from the actual date. Um, it won't because it's greater than. And, and just to maybe test this, let me actually choose a date that's in here. Let's do this 2010-0124. So I'm going to change this to 24. And if I use greater than, that's excluding the smallest value. And you can see that those have now dropped out. It just goes to the next date, 0125. If I do greater than or equal to, then I get that 20124 back in again, okay? So that's the symbol for greater than or equal to, and that will be inclusive. Okay, any other questions? Okay. So I've left you an exercise to explore on your own, um, this challenge to kind of find uh, this particular subset of stuff. I'm gonna keep going on uh, just to keep up with the time. Um, the next part we're gonna look at is how we actually manipulate the data in the table. So that was kind of selecting data. Maybe we wanted to actually do something with the data, right? We collected this data, we should do something with it. Um, and there's a number of ways that Pandas allows you to actually you know, create new columns, manipulate the columns that are there, 
uh, maybe take two columns and combine them together to make another column. Uh, there's all sorts of very easy ways of, of doing these uh, in, um, in Pandas. So to start this, I'm going to make a small subset of my original database here. And what I'm going is taking the first 21 rows, and then I'm only taking these columns. So I'm going to focus my selection down to just the name, the RA deck, and the photometry in the two mass filter. So if I run that, you can see that I get this kind of little mini table that's a little bit easier to, to work with. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to first just change the names of my columns because you know this is the name that comes with the database, but you know, maybe J2 mass is a little bit too clunky of a name to work with. So I might want to just change it to J because um, all of these are two mass. So that's kind of redundant. So the notation for doing that is this um, uh, rename. And if you're changing the columns, then what you do is you're giving the columns parameter equal to a uh, dictionary. And the dictionary is a very simple one. The key is the old column and it is assigned to the new column name. And then the next key is the old column, the new column name. So it's this kind of notation. And the last parameter here, in place equals true, means I'm changing the table, right? If I just did this without in place equals true, um, I could display it and it would show the difference, but it actually doesn't change the table. It just temporarily shows that difference. So if I really want to permanently change the table, I do this in place and true. So if I type that, um, I'll get the same table back, but notice the J2 mass, H2 mass, and K2 mass have been replaced with these shorter column names. Now that's not that big of a you know scientific deal, but it's, it's sometimes if you're working with databases from other sources, um, it may just be more intuitive to kind of rename those so that it makes sense uh, to what you're actually doing. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to create a few new columns by just doing some math on the columns that are there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create these colors. And we talked about yesterday that colors are just differences in magnitudes. And so I'm creating three new columns that are colors by just subtracting the J magnitude or the H magnitude from the J magnitude, the KS from the H, and the KS from the J. So I've got these three filters and I'm combining them into three different colors. And of course, being scientists, it's not just the measurements we care about, but it's the uncertainties. So we also have to compute the uncertainties. Uh, and if you have you know, done your you know, basic error analysis, or maybe this is something new for you, um, we're gonna treat these uncertainties, which are already in the table for the magnitudes, that's these columns here. Oops, sorry, we're going a little slow here. Right. So these columns here, J2 mass E, oh boy, <laughs> there we go, uh, J2 mass E, H2 mass E, these are all the uncertainties and they're much smaller than the values here. Um, we're going to treat them as independent uncertainties and that means we're just going to sum the squares of the uncertainties and take the square root. And that's what this mathematical operation looks like. We're using the NumPy square root function and then we're taking the column and this double star means raised to the power of two. So this is an easy way to put squared. Now notice we're squaring the column, but what it really does is it squares every single number within the column. So I can do that for my J error and H error. Now it gives me the J H uncertainty, same thing with H and K, same thing with J and K. So this is a nice quick way that I can propagate my uncertainties. So I get uncertainties for not just the magnitudes, but also for the colors. Uh, so if I let that run, uh, I get a bigger table now and I've got some new columns in here and those new columns are indeed my colors. So there's J minus H, H minus K, J minus K. I can kind of quickly just check to make sure that, that that makes sense. Yep, this minus this, oops, sorry. This minus this is about 0.227, so that's good. And the uncertainties look like they're about the right size as well. All right, so that's a good check to make. I always see every time I do these operations, I just kind of do a quick check. I, I'm pretty sure Python is going to do it right, but sometimes I don't program it right. So I just want to make sure I check that it makes sense numerically. All right, so that's an example of making these columns. You can also do some quick sort of assessment of the quantitative properties of these columns. So for example, I could take, I can do this dot mean function, which will give me the mean values of all of the columns in my table, including the ones I've just made, all right? Um, there's also median and standard deviation. Um, one that I particularly like is called quantile. So it'll take the 16th percentile, 50th percentile, which is the median, and the 84th percentile values in those ranges, 
and report those back here as a kind of a new table. And then even better, Pandas has this kind of one-stop shopping quantitative summary called describe. And if I just write dot describe on my uh, table here, it gives me all kinds of things, the number of elements, the means, the standard deviation, the minimum, these quantiles, the maximum. So you get kind of everything all at once. Um, so that's a nice way of kind of getting the sort of summary of your data uh, uh, in just one step. Now, as I mentioned, Pandas also has built-in plotting tools. So here's an example, and it's, it's called by this function plot. So here's an example of a scatter plot that's just pointing different points across the screen. Uh, and so I'm plotting the X and Y values, and I'm throwing in the uncertainties with this X error and Y error uh, variables. And I'm just pointing them to the columns that contain that information. So if I plot that, and where we go, I've got a nice color color diagram like we talked about yesterday with the uncertainties that I've just made from my database. And I can also do a histogram. So this is a histogram of the J magnitude values. You can see that for example, most of my sources are pretty faint. Remember, larger numbers for magnitude means fainter, but I got this one outlier here is pretty bright. Um, and then another visual plot that uh, Christian showed a, a much prettier version of, but this is kind of the same version. This is called a box plot and it's like describe, it's more of a visual summary of the data. So if I run this and I have this one little parameter set here because it's a little easier to see these kind of stacked on top of each other, um, you get this, you know, nice little plot here that shows the range of all your values. Now, the one problem is that this uses the same range for all of your numbers. So, for example, the declination variable uh, is kind of overpowering <laughs> my, my range. Uh, so one way, thing I could do to fix that is I can make a new um, data frame that, um, well, let's just choose the uh, J minus H h minus ks and j minus ks values. And then I can just plot the boxes for those and then I'll get something that shows me kind of the range of colors for those. And what this is showing is kind of the full range, uh, the sort of median and 25 to 75%. And then in this case, I think there's a couple outliers in here. So again, these are nice, very nice and quick ways of visualizing the quantitative elements in your data set. Any questions on that? Either it's super crystal clear or you guys are just right in there playing with it, which is fantastic. I hope that's the case. <laughs> um, okay, so again, I will leave an exercise there for you to do on your own. And the solution is there if you wanna check on that. Um, uh, let's move on uh, into our, our, our probably, our, our hopefully our second last uh, topic. We'll see how much time we got. Um, this is now uh, combining tables. Now, you know, one of the things, you know, so a lot of these manipulations we can kind of easily do you know, with Excel and stuff like that. Um, but one of the powerful things that Pandas has is it's able to take multiple tables and merge them or concatenate them to combine them as data sets. So you're not just talking about like individual rows now, you're taking entire tables and figuring out ways of kind of merging them together. And this is particularly useful if we are, for example, taking multiple catalogs and we want to see, you know, is are the sources that are in this catalog also in this catalog? Um, you know, are, is this catalog that has the spectra, do we also see those sources also here in the photometry catalog so we can merge those together? So this is one way of kind of merging our data sets to get, you know, all the information we need for, for whatever sources we're looking at. So we're going to look at two, oh, sorry, three different commands here. Um, concat and append are basically the same thing. They just kind of take tables and kind of, excuse me, smash them together. But merge is the one that's really interesting because it allows us to find the intersections between tables to see where sources are common between the two um, and then merge those tables together. So again, just to remind, we're gonna look at these two uh, tables, the spectra and sources tables. And I always like to just kind of take a look at the columns just to make sure I remember what I'm looking at. Um, and one thing I'll point out is that uh, both of these have different column names, although there's a couple of commons. There's source key here and here, and it'll turn out those are the same numbers. Um, and there's also note is produced twice. So there's a couple of places where you can see the same columns, but everything else is different. 
So these are two distinct databases, but they're linked by this one common column. Um, so first thing we can do is we could just use this concat function and just see what happens. Um, and what this is going to do is going to combine these tables. And if I just run this, this command, um, remember that each table was about 1,500 rows and it had a different number of columns. And you'll notice the output of this is about 3,000 rows and 82 columns. This is a much bigger table. You'll also notice that down here at the bottom, most of the values are NANDs. As I scroll over, uh, at some point, they transition so that most of these values are here and most of these numbers are NANDs. So all this table did is just take the two tables and stack them together. And then if one table had those columns or didn't have those columns, just fill them up with essentially blank spots, right? So this is literally the sort of like simplest thing you can do is just take two tables and just tape them together and just fill in blank spots for all the columns that you don't have information, right? And so that's why we get this big massive table. Now, I should say that, you know, if you have a lot of tables that are very similar in structure, this can be useful because it allows you to, you know, stack together all these and to make one big super table. An example might be that, you know, if you're, if we're combining the data that's reduced over several nights, those tables should have very similar structures. So we can just concat them together and get one table that, that has everything. Uh, sorry, Carlos has a question. Can we download this Jupyter to work on our team? Uh, yes, yeah, thank, thank you, Dino. Thanks for, for feeling that. Yeah, you can download this directly, but yeah, it, uh, I think it's just right in here, file and then download. So you can just download it that way. Um, now there's another way, this is how we join them uh, just by stacking together. There's another option you could put in which says join inner. And what inner does is it looks for the columns that are in common and just returns those. So if I run those, we're gonna get a much smaller table that only contains these two columns, the source key and the note. And that's it, because those are the only columns that are in common between these two data sets. So again, this might be useful if you have different kinds of data sets, but you want only the data that's common amongst all of them, then this will just focus on those columns and drop everything else. So that's another way to kind of smooth that, that merger. Um, that looks the same, so I'm gonna skip that. Um, and then another way we can do this is using the append function. Oh, I think I know what this was. We're gonna do another option, which is axis equals one. So before we stack these vertical, we can also stack these horizontally. So I've done the same call, but I've done axis equals one. I actually don't need the joining equal inner, so I'll just get rid of that. And what I have now is a table that has 1500 rows, but 84 columns. And if I scroll through, remember source key is common to both. We see source key here. As I scroll over, you see it shows up again. So what this has done is taken the two tables and instead of merging them this way, it's merged them this way. <laughs> so, uh, and if one table has more rows than the other one, it'll just fill in some blank spaces uh, when there's excess. So there's multiple ways that we can stack these tables together depending on what our needs are. And this is useful if you have two tables that have very different uh, columns and you hopefully can line them up appropriately. It's a little, that's a little risky, so we have to be careful with that. Um, and then you can also do the same process by just calling the append function uh, from one table and adding in the other table. And that basically gives you the same result as concat. So it's just another way of doing the same thing. Right? So again, you can see we've stacked one table on top of another one. Now the next function is a merge and merge takes those two tables and then figures out a way to figure out how to combine them so that they are the sources that are in common are actually lined up. And it uses this key, uh, this parameter called on, and on equals whatever column is common between the two databases. Now remember, the column that was was the source key. So if I call this command, and the result that comes out is a smaller table, it's about 1,286 rows. It's got all of the columns from both tables. But what it's done is it's merged and made sure to check that if there's a source key in this table and it's the same as a source key in this table, then those are the same row. So now we actually have really merged the data so that we're referring to the same object across both tables by using this common column between them. 
This is a very common database kind of management system that when you're, you have multiple databases information, you just make sure that there's a reference from one database to another one using a key or a common name or something like that. And that's what we've done here. So we've lined up these two data tables, which might be in completely different orders, but we have this reference key that's the same between them and we kind of merge that data through that key. Uh, and so we get all the information, not only the source information for the spectrum, but now that's also lined up to the actual source information designation and stuff like that. So that's a great way to kind of merge these data sets together. There's other options in how this is done. Um, I'll leave you as an experiment to, to play around with those. Uh, some of them give you everything. Some of them only give you stuff on the left side. Some of them give you on the right side. So that's stuff to kind of play with. Um, now, one thing I'll point out is that the other column that was common between these databases was this note column. And you'll notice that these have actually been changed. Now we have note X and the other end, note Y. So it's kept track of the fact that it's combining the source key, but it wants to keep those two independent columns and just make sure they're not overlapping. They just give them new names. And you can control that by just changing um, the suffixes. Uh, and that's this option right here. So if X and Y is kind of too esoteric, we can do the same thing, but just change it to note old and note new or note one and note two, whatever you want. Uh, okay, so let's see. So, okay, so Bridget, you're asking if we get the result we use, then the on again, but with a different column name. So you want you want to change this column name, the source key column name? Um, not change it, but can we, if we have multiple column names that are the same, can we use like multiple on, on, like that was my question. Like, can oh we yeah. Can you... time or do we have to do one and then wait until we get that one and then like change that one and then change it again? So I don't actually know because I've never played with one where you've tried to match two different columns at the same time. I can imagine that that's tricky because um, uh, if one column matches up but the other one doesn't, I don't know what the can't code does to that, right? So I don't know what the hierarchy of selecting which one to match up on uh, is what. Um, so, so I think the short answer is I would suggest just using one column because that makes the most logical sense. But if you want to play and see if you can break things, then definitely try it. You can try it with different columns, but they have to be both in there. And I say in this case, we do have two columns that are in common, but they're they're just note columns and they're actually very different kind of information. So I'm not quite sure how those will combine. But you know, the best thing to do, Bridget, is kind of play with it and just see what happens. Oh, Dino actually answered this on the chat. Sorry. Yes, yeah, so you can sit on to be a list as opposed to just one, uh, one, one string. Thanks, Dino. I don't know what happens though. So you know, see what happens and see, <laughs> see if we can interpret it. All right. Thank you. Yeah, totally. Any other questions? Okay, so let's close up and um, I'll just do the save part because this will be pretty short. And again, there's a nice exercise here if you wanna play with that and see if, uh, if you understood uh, how to do the mergers. Um, we're gonna see how now to save our table out. So we've you know, we, we read these tables in, we've manipulated it in some way, maybe we've created some new columns and now we wanna actually save our information, possibly to save it into a form that we can use in, in a paper. Uh, and so there's a few commands to do this, and they're all kind of worded the same way. It's dot two underscore and what format you want your output to be. Uh, so that could be CSV, it could be Excel. There's actually quite a few, a long list of things. Now I should say, if you're doing this on Google Colab, you can save off these files and they will appear in this folder section here uh, under the content. Um, so right now, my content folder has some sample data that Google sort of provides uh, everyone to play with. But you're going to see that these files will show up in here, and then you can download that uh, if you want to look on your computer. So let's start by just making um, combining some of the stuff we've done up here. We're going to merge our sources inspector table on the source key, and then we're going to select those sources where I have a Simbad spectral type. So if it's blank, it gets rejected. 
I'm going to get the higher signal to noise spectra. And then I'm going to reset the index because that's definitely dropped a whole bunch of stuff. And then I'm just going to take these four columns uh, from that table. So I've done merged a whole bunch of stuff all at once. Uh, and it, fortunately, it doesn't take very long to run. Uh, so, you know, all of that work, it's done it in a second or two. And now I've got a table of about 274 objects. And I've got the designations, the name of the data file, the two mass J magnitudes, and the spectral types from Zimbab. Now, uh, I could save this off as a CSV file. If you recall, I read in my original data as CSV files. I can save it back out as a CSV file. And that, again, is just this dot two CSV, the name of the file. And I've set this other parameter index equals false. Again, just like the previous one where I had reset the index, if you don't set that equal to, so if you set the other one, we had to drop the index. Here, we're just saying index equals false says don't save the index as a column. If you leave this in, it's not the end of the world. It just produce a, an extra column that just has a bunch of numbers in it, which you may or may not want. I usually don't want them. So I keep index equals false. So let me run this. And what it's done is it's saved this file on my computer. And I can see it if I refresh my folder system, there it is. And if I download that file, uh, and I'll just put it in my desktop here, and I'll open it up and you won't see this unless I change the share, um, but I've opened it up in Excel and voila, I have a spreadsheet. Uh, see, can you guys see what I'm seeing? Yes. My computer is kind of freaked out there. <laughs> so, um, all right, so yeah, there's a nice little spreadsheet there. Um, sorry, I need to get myself back. Okay, um, so you can do the same thing. You can save it to an Excel file if you're into Excel. Um, one that's particularly useful is saving it to a latex table. So let me do that. And um, a late, latex is the uh, command uh, function that we're gonna use for publishing our data. So there's just a particular like layout language. Again, it's a little bit like programming, but it's more kind of just like a HTML style markup language. Um, if I take a look at that file, so let me download that. And I will show you what that looks like once it pops up. Okay, so this is just a simple text editor. And you can see that it's reformatted my table or my data into this kind of very different, different looking language. But this is the language we use to display tables in our publications. So I've gone directly from the table that I've been working with to a table that I can now stick right into my paper and I'm done, right? I may have to do a little editing it, but it's, it's pretty much done, right? And so done all the sort of notation for this. So that's a very nice, efficient way of going from your analysis to something you can publish. Uh, okay, go back. Um, now there's other things you can save your panda ta pandas tables to. Um, one example, Roman talked about the dictionary structure for pandas. So you can take your table and save it off the dictionary. So in this notation, what I've done is I've selected the first 10 rows of that table up here, and I'm turning it into a dictionary. And the variable that comes out has this particular structure. So all these dictionaries always have these little curly braces. Um, and so there's a key data file that points to a, another dictionary where every index points to the value for the data file. And there's another one with a designation. And J2 math. So basically, it's like reformatted my table into a set of sort of nested uh, uh, dictionary sets. Um, this is a little clunky. So there's an, a few other options you can use. One of the ways I like to use it is called orient equals list. And what that does is make a dictionary, but now it's just each column name is a key and it points to a list. And that list again is those square brackets, uh, a list of the values for uh, each of those things. So this is just kind of turning my table into a set of lists. And the lists are going down by column. I can also change this by a list that goes across by row, and that's the orient equals index. Sorry, I'm getting the sun in my eye right now. Um, and so now that index number, that's the first number on the table there, points to, again, a dictionary that contains the values for each row. So depending on how you want to organize the data, you can either sort it by column or you can sort it by row. Dictionary is pretty flexible for that. All right, so it is now six o'clock and, um, 
Oh, and I should say, you can also take tables like this and turn it into pandas as well. So this is kind of the opposite uh, form. And you can see that I start with a dictionary and I can very quickly turn it into table as well, which then I can do all the other things I want to manipulate with. Okay, so there's an exercise at the bottom that's sort of a summary of all those things. Um, I'm going to close it up now and see if there's any other questions. Um, and thanks everyone for being patient for our fourth workshop. I, hope, I think you probably very well earned a rest for tomorrow. Although you, uh, those of you in, in Lasse will have a, another workshop tomorrow, particularly those who are in the, um, the college group. Um, but what I encourage you to do is to spend uh, tomorrow to play with some of these different workshop um, uh, notebooks. Um, and if you have questions, both Roman and Dino will have office hours tomorrow. Dino has office hours right after this. So if you have some questions right now, uh, Dino will be available for that. Um, but if you have any questions now, I'm happy to take them. Uh, no, I, I, I need to play with all this stuff. But Absolutely understand, yeah. And, and maybe for tomorrow we will have some. Yep. And for tomorrow, we are not going to have workshop, only we will have the main top, the main talk. and The science talk at noon, yep. Right. So we have one day to, to practice. Yeah, so yeah. So yeah, so, part of the reason I'm giving you a day off is I want you to spend some time to kind yes. of like play with this and practice and find out how it works or not. Um, and I think, yes, as you start to explore, you'll, you'll find some things that work or don't work. Errors will come up that you're not quite sure what to do with. And we can definitely help with that. Yes, yes, definitely. We we will just very with the next for tomorrow. We will be playing with all of this. Yeah, definitely. Yes, yes. Wow, this is good. <laughs> it probably feels like a little bit of a fire hose right now. So um, yes. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well. Uh, if there aren't any questions, then um, Juan, I, did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to know how we could attend to office hours because I think Dino has office hours right now. Yeah, so Dino, uh, do you want to switch over to your Zoom office hours? So I know we had this confusion yesterday because I stayed on this Zoom link, but I think Carlos went to the office hours and I wasn't there. So why don't we... If, if you want to attend Dina's office hours, we'll switch over to that Zoom link um, as mm -hmm. soon as we're closed up here. Um, and do you have access? Do you know where to find that Zoom link? I just put it in the chat. Yeah. Oh, Dina, Dina just put it in the chat. Thanks, Dina. Yeah. Okay. And where can we find the Zoom link for the office hours anyways? So if you go on the uh, web page um, that I sent yesterday, okay. the mm -hmm. calendar, has the links embedded in the calendar Ooh. dates. So if I go well, to, um, um, yeah, so yeah, so go to the home here. Oh, you can't see my screen, sorry. <laughs> uh, there we go. And it looks like it's, it's a little, I think my computer's pretty frustrated with it by now. Um, so what I might do is actually put the links in here as well, but the, the calendar mm -hmm. here, as it comes up, um, should have the Zoom links embedded in there. Okay, no worries. Okay, yeah, I, sorry, my computer's just doing too much right now. It's Okay, so here we go. So if I click on uh, Dino's office hours, you can see the Zoom link right here. Okay, great, okay. thank you. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? No, for tomorrow. <laughs> for tomorrow, yes. The questions sure. will emerge tomorrow. That's okay. Yeah. Or maybe, okay. maybe at the nine. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yes, yes. Thank you, Adam. This is so nice. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great, great. Uh, okay, so then in that case, um, again, uh, Roman and, and Dino will be available uh, tomorrow. And I will see you on Thursday. And we're going to have two more workshops. One is on uh, AstroPy and AstroQuery. These are uh, tools that we use for a, really a kind of astronomy research. Um, and then the afternoon is going to be uh, SPLAT, which is our code for doing spectral reduction. And so one thing I would suggest to do uh, before Thursday is to try is follow instructions and see if you can get SPLAT to operate on your computers. It's not something we can yet run on Google Colab. Um, we're hoping maybe we can change that this summer. 
Um, so uh, if you can try to do the installation for SPLAT and if you have questions, uh, do bring them up in office hours, uh, you know, tomorrow or even uh, Tuesday morning, or excuse me, Thursday morning. Okay, great. Everyone have a great evening and uh, we'll, we'll see you uh, in the next few days. Thank you so much. Have a good night. You too. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, welcome.